Hi there, this is Unmesh from Piximperfect. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. Today, you and I are going to go through the entire process of creating a natural composite with a focus on number one, painting the shadows and number two, matching the color and the lighting. You see, whenever you're creating that new composite and you bring in a new element onto it, I always recommend that you extract the original shadow of that new element and bring that over as well. That way, you create the most natural result as natural as possible. However, to be able to extract the shadows, it has to be on a flat, clean and nice surface. And also, the angle of the surface of the old situation or the old image should match the angle of the new surface where you bring in that element, right? Many a times, this is not a possibility. And for those times, we might have to manually paint in the shadows and make some adjustments. That's what we're going to extensively cover in this video, along with many other essential and versatile techniques. So without any further ado, let's get started. Back in the magical world of Photoshop, and if you want to go ahead and download this photo and follow along, you, my awesome friend, already know what to do. Check the links in the description. So, the very first thing as usual whenever you're creating a composite is making the selection. Now, the technique that I'm going to use to make the selection here is what I've already covered in this video. So, please do watch it. I've already done the selection here to save time. So, let's load that by going to select and load selection. And I have it saved on a channel named subject. Hit OK. I have the selection right there and click on the mask button. Now, we have the subject layer masked out. Okay. Let's drop it into the new background. To be able to do that, just open the new background in Photoshop. So I'm just going to open that up and drop it right over here at the top. Now do keep in mind that you can copy and paste layers in the later versions of Photoshop. So let's get back to the subject document. Select that layer, press Ctrl or Command C. Go to the background and press Ctrl or Command V. Now at this point, if you press Ctrl or Command D for transformation, Along with the subject, the bounding box will also select its original background because it's masked out and it can be a hassle to be able to have access to the original background and also not have to deal with the additional bounding box areas. Here's a quick tip. Right click on the subject and convert it to smart object. That way, if you want to have access to any old stuff, double click on it. It will open up another document where you have the mask and where, where you can get back anything. Anyway, let's close that. Now, also converting it into a smart object allows you to have absolute non-destructive nature. You can make it smaller, bigger, a ton of times without losing quality, losing pixel details or anything. Press Ctrl or Command T and let's adjust it accordingly. We're not going to follow the law of perspectives here like we have covered in this video because it just won't fit. Because if we look at it in that aspect, uh, let's place her next to this man. If we do that, she would be probably of this height, right? That looks about right. Now, if you do place the anchor point on the horizon, let's bring her to the center, right? With the same height. If you do place the anchor point around the horizon, okay, just even a little up. And if you try to bring her closer, she would look absolutely huge. It might be the actual case, but we're not going to take a risk. We're just going to place her in a way that we think it's good. Also, I feel she is leaning a little bit towards the right. So let's go ahead and just rotate her just so slightly, just like this. And this looks about right. Now, I know what many of you are thinking that Unmish, this might not be perspectivically right. I understand that. But many a times, have you ever noticed that whenever we take an actual photo, with some interesting lights, or if the angle is a little too creative, a lot of viewers might think that is Photoshop, even if it's an actual photo. So if I did make her too big, it was just not looking natural artistically. So sometimes you have to take the artistic route instead of the realistic route to look more realistic. Now we can start by creating the shadows and we don't have to completely paint the shadow from scratch. We can have a rough draft or a rough base. And the way to create a rough draft is hold the controller command and click on the subject. That way you have the selection of the subject and just under the subject, create a brand new layer and you can name this shadow. And this is just a rough draft. Okay. At the moment. Now fill this with black with the foreground color as black. Press Alt Backspace or Option Delete on a Mac. Press Ctrl or Command D to deselect. Now you can convert this into a smart object, but I wouldn't recommend that because we've got painting to do. Press Ctrl or Command D, right click on it and then choose Distort. 
Now, before we start distorting it, just study the other shadows in the image. Look at the shadow of this man on a bicycle. If the man on the bicycle is of this height, just compare it with the length of the shadow. So in this case, the shadow is about more than two times the actual height. So about 2.2 or 2.5-ish. Just keep that in mind. So when we distort it, we have to extend it about 2.2 to 2.5 times. So she's standing right here. This would be one time. This would be two time. And up to this mark, I think we have to extend it. You don't have to be accurate here. I know this looks crazy awkward, but we have to adjust it in a way that looks just a little bit all right. I guess we can actually work with that. Hit enter or return once you're satisfied. Now it is time for us to actually start painting the shadows. And for that right now, simply select the hard round brush with black as the foreground color, just painting over it and correct little things. Also to erase something, whenever you're working with the brush, let's say you painted something right there and if you want to erase it, just hold the tilde key, the key next to one. And once you hold that, the same brush becomes the same eraser with the same properties. And if you paint over it, it's going to erase that thing. If you're using an older version of Photoshop, this might not work. For that, you might have to go to the eraser tool and erase those certain areas. All right. So let's just paint the shadow according to the shape of the subject. The light is coming from the left hand side. So the shadow should fall on the right hand side, right? Also, when you're placing the subject, do not forget to just place her according to the light. If in the background, the light is coming from the right hand side, in the subject as well, the light should be from the right hand side. If not, you can always flip it. Let's paint the shadow accordingly. Right now, I'm just drawing the shape of the foot right over here. There are some things you just have to guess. Similarly, let's draw the shadow of the other leg. Let's zoom in. And again, according to where the light is falling, draw the shadows. Now notice the height where the legs cross. Now, of course, there are clothes here, but just notice the height. So according to that height, it should cross right over here as well. So keep that in mind. Keep the angle in mind. So what I meant was it should cross right here. Now, of course, uh, there will be some coverings here. So just let that be for now. That's just for guidance. By the way, if you want to draw straight lines between any two points, just dab once. Hold the shift key, dab one more time on the other side. So that way you have a straight line. So this will be really helpful. So similarly right here as well, just dab once and let's draw a straight line till this point. Now I know I understand legs are not absolutely straight, but this gives us a nice base to work with. You can also use the pen tool to draw that first and then fill it. I'm just more comfortable painting it by hand. If you're using a tablet, this can be really fun. And by the way, if you're not using a tablet, you can first make a selection and then fill it. Now that does look like an excellent base to start the work from. Now also, she is wearing some clothes where the light is also passing through slightly. So it will also have a shadow, but this time it will be a little less opaque. In other words, a little more transparent. So just above the shadow layer, let's create one more layer and call it shadow two. Okay. And don't worry about the opacity right now. Just fill in the dress areas. Keep that in mind. Just draw in that. These are the additional dress areas because there are lots of folds. So we can actually keep them um, opaque. Just some areas we can keep them a little more transparent. Now that they're done, we would just simply decrease the opacity. See, we are creating this brilliant look right over here. So we will keep it overall dark at the moment because later on we would anyway decrease the opacity. So keep it at about 80%. Now on top of that, let's do another shadow three. Let's set this one to also something. So we'll set this to about 60%. Okay, now we have additional things to work with. And on top of that, let's do one more just to add a little bit fold to it. And this is shadow four. Now, 
the reason I created them on separate layers is because we wanted the ability to control this later. Okay, so this is just for the shadow and let's keep it at about 40. So you see that curl shadow going in from right there. So let's keep it at, well, let's increase it 50. And also let's add a few more curls here just to create more realism. Now, of course, we have just done too much. So let's group all of these shadows into one layer. So select the first one, hold the shift key, select the last one, and then press Ctrl or Command G. And let's name this shadow, okay? Now, we're gonna change the blend mode of this group to multiply. And before we move into any further steps, let's just go ahead and save this PSD because we worked so hard on the shadows, we don't want to lose it. Ctrl or Command S is your favorite and, and most useful shortcut. Don't forget it, it's your best friend. Control or Command S, pick Simperfect Composite. And there you have it, my friend. Now it is time for us to move on to the next step and that is coloring the shadows. And to move further, let's convert this group into a smart object by right clicking on it and choosing Convert to Smart Object. Now, if you want the layers back anytime you can get it back, you can just right click on it and then choose Convert to Layers and you will get everything back. Anyway, let's right click on it and convert to smart object because we will blur it down the line and probably apply some masks and filters. It just makes it a little more convenient. So to apply a color, create a solid color adjustment layer and choose at the moment any color you want and hit OK. Hold the Alt key or the Option key and click on the line between these two layers. That way this color is limited to the shadow. Also to make sure that the shadow is only darkening stuff, make sure again and again that the blend mode of the shadow layer is multiplied. Now we will try to match the color of the shadow with the shadows nearby. And the best way to do that is double click on the solid color adjustment layer and just take a sample of the shadow nearby. Just take a sample of the color. So now have a look at the original shadow. Is it looking anything like that? No, because of course it's on the multiply blend mode and it's darkening stuff. So we need to make certain changes to it. At least we are on the same hue. But before we jump into any conclusions, also we need to decrease the opacity of the shadow. So let's go to the shadow layer and decrease the opacity to about 50%. This is a good starting point and it's also matching with the shadows nearby. Now at this point, I feel that these areas needed to be a little more brighter, these shadow areas. So we can always double click on it, go in here and make them even more lighter. So this was opacity 100, this was 80. So let's go 70 on this one. Where it's 60, let's go 50 on this one. Where it is 50, let's go 40 on this one. Press Ctrl or Command S to save it. And now let's get back to Piximperfect Composite. And now it's a little more realistic. So now let's get back to our color and apply the color of our choice. Now, if you really want to compare the shadows, you can always go to the background and just grab a little bit of the shadow areas from here. And maybe also grab this area. Press Ctrl or Command J and place it at the very top. Okay and press Ctrl or Command T and bring it right over here. And that's just a good comparison to see how the shadows stack up. So this will help you to find out whether you need to darken, apply a little more color, so on and so forth. So let's get back to our shadow and I feel this needs to be a little more darker. So probably at about 65, okay? And now let's go to color and give it a little more blue. That looks okay for the moment, hit okay. Now the next step is, as you already might have guessed, blurring the shadow. So first of all, let's just remove these references. We don't really need it anymore. Let's come back to shadow. Now keep in mind, this is a smart object. So whatever blurring filter we apply, we can always change that later. So let's go to filter and blur gallery. This time we're going to choose iris blur. Let's choose that. Now wherever the contact point is, we're going to place an iris. So let's zoom in around the leg and bring one point to one leg. First of all, let's make it very small like this. Just make it flat, oval, and now let's stretch it. Just like so. Now these are the four points for the blur stars and the edge of the ellipse is where the blur ends, which means if the blur is at about five, this will be zero around these points and gradually increase it to five on the edge and beyond that it would be five. So let's bring the points close together. Let's zoom in. And also, if you want to individually move these points, hold the Alt key or the Option key, click on the point so that you can individually move them. So let's bring them very, very close. Okay. Or you can actually 
place it at the very center of both the legs. And now gradually increase the blur to where it matches with the shadows around it. Let's try 30. That looks about right. Hit OK. Now these areas around the legs are still very sharp. So we need to address that as well. Let's apply an overall Gaussian blur by going to filter, blur and then Gaussian blur. Let's go with one or two. Let's go with two. How do you feel about that? Two is okay. Do notice that the ground is a little bit blurred and her legs are very sharp. We're going to deal with that later. But for right now, two is fine according to the ground and hit OK once you're OK with that. And now that is looking absolutely natural, isn't it? Now, of course, we need to make certain more adjustments in the coming steps. Now, the ground is not absolutely flat. It has lots of ups and downs in it. So unless you engrave that in the shadow as well, it won't look natural no matter what you do. With the shadow layer selected, just create a mask. Click on the mask button right there. Take the brush and this time, take a soft round brush, okay? With the flow and opacity at about 100, just create those bumps around these pebbles and little stuff on the ground. So right here, I'm just gonna paint with black and create a little bump. See, just making that little change makes a hell lot of difference. Here's the before, very flat, very unnatural, but just after creating that, it just makes so much of a difference. So keep those little bumps in mind and create those little grooves inside the shadows to make them look realistic. Just that little groove we did there, here's the before, so flat, here's the after, it makes it look natural. Even if you zoom out, it'll make it look absolutely realistic. Before, after, see that little change? So do those grooves here and there. These little rocks. Now there should be a little bump right over here. So let's give that as well. I'm just increasing the brush size to add a little bit of that softness there, which matches with that of the shadow. These little grooves make the world of difference. Have a look at the overall before and after. So here's the before, super flat, and here's the after, just after doing that groove. Now, if you ask me, still the shadow doesn't feel right. There is something missing. Can you guess what that is? Let's examine a real shadow to understand this concept. Let's come back to the original subject image. Let's turn on the background. If you zoom in right over here, you would notice there is shadow, of course, but wherever the leg is Touching the ground, there's some additional shadow. We can call this contact point shadow. If my hand is right over here and there is light falling on it, of course, there would be shadow on the table. But where my hand is exactly touching the surface of the table, those areas would be even darker. And those are called contact point shadows. And that's what we have to add in the existing shadow. Let's come back to our Piximperfect composite. And let's, first of all, zoom in right over there. And just above the shadow color layer, let's create one more layer and name it Contact Point Shadow. Now we're gonna use this existing shadow as a mask. So hold the control or command and click on the shadow. That way we have a mask and click on the mask button right there, okay? Now we also wanna subtract the mask areas of that shadow. Hold the control or command, click on the mask of the original shadow. All right, now we need to invert it and delete it. Press Control Shift I, Command Shift I to invert the selection and fill that area with black. So with the contact point shadow layer selected, it's mask selected, press Alt Backspace. So we kind of erase the extras from right here. You see that cuts? That was essential. Now, let's come back to the layer and take the brush and just first of all, let's give it one layer of darkness around the legs. Just dab once with black like this. Let's do the same around the other leg as well. So we have the first layer. This is a good starting point. Let's decrease the opacity and slowly and gradually increase it to a point that looks okay here. 34 is all right. Now, let's create one more layer and this is contact point shadow two. This is where we go in and paint in the absolute dark areas. We need the same mask here, so why not create a group? Select the first one, hold the controller command, select the second one, press controller command G to create a group and bring the mask to the group. That way, both of them have a common mask. Let's come to CP Shadow 2 layer and then start painting those absolutely dark areas. You can decrease the flow to about 5 or 10 to have more precision here. I'm going to go with 2. This is like dodging and burning. Alright, this leg is done. 
let's decrease the opacity slightly, about 65%. Similarly, let's do the other side. Might not look like a big thing, but when you zoom out, this makes the world of difference. So here's the before. It looks like the leg is in the air, and here's the after. Just by doing that, the leg is, feels connected. But still, there is something funny about it. And that, my friend, brings us to our next step. And that is, the shadows here are so dark. Don't you think that a little bit of that darkness would also fall a little bit on the legs, right? So we need to add a little darkness on the subject as well, especially near the shadows. So create a layer above the subject and also limit it just at the subject by holding the Alt key or the Option key and clicking on the line between these two layers. This way, no matter what we paint here, it will be limited to the subject. Have a look. See, it won't paint anywhere else. So here's what we need to do. We need to take a sample color of the shadow nearby and just paint over a little bit on the subject. Erase the extras. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You might say, Mish, this is crazy. <laughs> but wait for it. Let's do the other leg first. A little bit on the cloth is fine too. That looks about right. Now, all we need to do is to change the blend mode from normal to, guess what the blend mode is which darkens? Multiply. Now, this is of course too much. Zoom in and slowly and gradually decrease the opacity. And increase it and stop at the point where it matches nicely. I feel that about 46 or 50 would be a great place to be. And there you have a nice darkness there. Here's the before, not matching at all. Here's the after, now we are doing something. You can also go ahead and add a little more. Okay, there you have it. Now it is high time that we started matching the color and the lighting. And the easiest way to match the ambient color and the lighting is simply making the copy of the background layer by selecting the background layer first and then pressing Ctrl or Command J. Bring it to the very top above the subject, okay? Also limit it to the subject by holding the Alt key or the Option key and clicking on the line between these two layers and simply blur it by going to Filter, Blur and then Gaussian Blur. Let's apply a pretty high blur so that all of the details are gone because we only want what? Colors. Let's go with about 200, hit OK and simply change the blend mode to, guess what? What do we want here? Color, right? So change the blend mode to color. Now this is matching just way too much that it is completely letting go of its original color. We want you to have your originality here. So decrease the opacity to let's say about 40% and there we have matched so, so much. So here's the before and here's the after. Look at how much the color is matching. Now let's match the brightness and also when we do match the brightness, the colors might distract us. To create a luminosity check layer, in other words, to take away all the colors momentarily, in a more realistic perceptual way, you can create a solid color adjustment layer and choose gray or black or anything that does not have a saturation and change the blend mode to color, all right? Now, just under it, you're gonna create a curves adjustment layer and limit it just to the subject by holding the Alt key or the Option key and clicking on the line between these two layers or simply click on this button. That also creates a clipping mask. Let's zoom out and darken this overall subject. I feel like this matches, but also at the same time, her hair is getting too dark. If you look at the background, it's a little faded. So we need to take the shadows up a little bit, just like this, and now it is matching. Let's have a look. Here is the before, and here is the after. We have come close. Now we don't need the luminosity check layer. Let's simply delete that. I feel that we can add slight yellow to it, because if you have a look at the bright areas right here, they have a little yellowish tint. So let's go back to the curves, and go to the blue channel and just zoom in first of all right here and just simply decrease the blues because blue is the opposite of yellow. So slightly, just a very slight decrease that helps us a little bit. And there you go, here's the before, here's the after. Now is a really good time to go ahead and take a break and get back to the image. We are engrossed in this image for too long that we might miss certain mistakes or that we might not see certain color matching or color adjustments we might have to do to make it look more seamless. Now when I look at it, the background looks a little more warmer. And I feel that we need to add a little more warmth to the subject as well. For that, we're gonna create a curves adjustment layer again, and also limit it just to the subject by clicking on this button, creates a clipping mask. Now to add warmth, let's first of all go to the red channel, and we only wanna add warmth to the bright areas. Have a look, look at the dark areas. Dark areas are not warm. Where the light is falling, those areas are warm. So. Let's zoom in 
and increase the reds in the bright areas. You can take the help of the hand right there. Just click on the hand. And wherever you want to increase the reds, just click and drag that up. Areas corresponding to that brightness level will have an increase in reds. This is fine, but we don't want it to increase in the shadow areas. So let's click and drag it down and bring it back to normal. Also, let's go to the blue channel and add some more yellow to it. Slight bit. Let's do it only in the extreme highlights right here and bring it back in the shadow areas. All right. This adds a little warmth to it. Have a look. Here's the before. Looks not so warm if you compare it with the background. And if you turn that on, have a look. It adds a little warmth to it. Also matches so much with that of the background. Now, with all the adjustments that we have done, the darkness that we created from the shadow might be affected as well. So instead of keeping it at the very bottom, why don't we place it at the top? All right. Bring it at the top. Make sure it is still clipped. And as you do that, you will see a change here. So here was the before. See, it's looking very plain. And here's the after. As soon as we bring it at the top, it looks more natural. So before the darkness, of course, this is unrealistic. After the darkness, you know, it's just hands down a lot better. Now, let me share with you one more tip to take the shadow realism just off the charts. And that is, if you have a look at the cloth that she's wearing at the bottom, this is a little translucent. This is not absolutely opaque, right? So what if we add a pass through shadow? So right here, the shadow is going in this direction. So a little bit of the shadow we can see through her dress as well. So just above this layer, let's create one more layer. Hold the Alt key, the Option key and click on the line between these two layers to also limit that. And now take the brush and this time with a soft round brush, just take a sample of that shadow color and continue that shadow. That's it. Also, now let's erase and soften the extras. And you have guessed it, my friend, just decrease the opacity. See that difference it makes? Just look at the difference. Here's the before. And if I turn that on, here's the after. Just look at that. And this, my friend, is just mind bending. If you want to take it further, have a look at this bright rock right there. Why don't we take the brush and take a sample of that one as well. Decrease the flow to about 5% and paint that as well. See, those little see through things really make a difference. Now we are not done yet. Let's focus on the shadows of the subject. If you look at the shadows in the background, they're a little too bluish. So we need to add blues there as well. So create another curves adjustment layer and let's go to the blue channel and just focus on the shadows and it will be taken away from the bright areas. Don't worry about that. So in the shadows, let's zoom in and also focus on the shadows of the background. That will help you and just increase the blues a bit like this. Okay. Now you would want to limit it to the subject. So create a clipping mask by clicking on this button. Now, once we do increase the blues, I feel that increasing the greens a little bit will take away those pinkish magenta -ish tint there. So let's go to the green channel and let's increase that a bit. See, it's making it a little more natural, matching that with that at the background. Let's go to the red channel and try to decrease or increase it and see what works. Slight increase works. Let's go back to the green channel and increase it a bit. And there you have something for the shadows. Now the shadows look a little more natural. I would go ahead and increase a little more blues there. There you go. Look at the overall shadow. It's just matching so, so much. Now we only want it in the shadows. So double click on the right hand side of the limb and take it away from the highlights by taking the slider of the underlying layer from right to left. Break it apart to make the transition smoother. This looks all right. Hit OK. So let's take a look at the before and after. Here's the before. The shadows are just too colorful and not matching. Here's the after. Just, just so much better. But at the same time, I feel it's too much. So let's decrease the opacity to about 60, 70 ish. All right. Now we have a little more originality there. We are still not done yet. Have a look at the shadow of the cycle guy. It's a little darker, right? So we just need to get the shadow areas to be a little darker. Shadows on the right hand side. So one more curves adjustment layer. I know Pix Imperfect is synonymous to curves. Let's create one more curves. Just bring it down. Also limit it to the subject. Bring it down overall. This darkness seems about right. Let's play with the greens. I feel the green has gone too much. So slightly, I will decrease it. And also reds, 
slightly will decrease that as well. Okay, we only want to apply it on the right hand side. So select the mask, press Ctrl or Command I, take the brush, flow and opacity at 100 with a soft round brush, just paint on the right hand side with white. Again, this is harsh and we want to take this away from the bright area. So double click on the right hand side of the layer and hold the Alt key or the Option key, break apart the right hand side slider and take it apart like this. Okay. Hit OK. Let's take a look at the before and after. So here's the before. Look, not matching with that of the cycle guy. Here's the after. We are much closer. And as usual, let's decrease the opacity. About 75 would be right. Now, do you think we are done? Well, not yet. I feel that we can apply a global effect to just blend and bring everything together. And that is something we do at the end of every composite. And in this particular example, we can easily do that with a lookup table. So let's create a color lookup table and let's just slap in our favorite one, the usual one, <laughs> that is crisp warm. And once you do that, this scene just becomes complete. If you think it's too much, you can decrease the opacity to about 50%. And there, my friend, we have our composite. Do you want to take a look at how it would look without all the adjustments? Let me share that with you. This is without any of the adjustments. All right. Still looking okay. But once you turn all of these adjustments, have a look. It just starts to blend in so beautifully. Let's take a look without the shadows. Let's zoom in right there to just analyze and just appreciate the shadow. So here's without shadow and just adding the shadows just adds so, so much. Now, of course, you can take the time to make some adjustments to the shadow. There are so many things you can do. And uh, what if I tell you the image is still not complete? <laughs> because it isn't. If you look at the ground, it's a little blurry. But if you look at the subject's feet, it's too sharp. So let's add a bit of blur to the subject. So with the subject layer selected, make sure it's a smart object. Let's go to filter, blur, and then Gaussian blur. Let's add about one pixel blur right there. I feel that one would be enough. Hit OK. Now it's matching so good like crazy. Of course, we want the upper part of the subject to be sharp. So select the mask of the Gaussian blur or the smart filter, whatever you want to call it. And let's create a gradient with black at the top. So let's draw a gradient so that the upper parts are sharp and only the bottom part, this area is soft. So you can start a gradient from right here to go. And there you have it. So only this area is blurred. And as we go up, we get sharper and sharper. Boom, done. Now, on top of that, if you want to add some more noise to match it even more, that's up to you. But we're just doing too much. Time for us to do a quick little recap. First of all, bring in the subject to the new background. Just adjust the position of it. And then use the subject area to create a base shadow. Use distort. And this is just a base shadow. On top of that, start painting, start adding and subtracting. In this example, I did this with a brush. You can also use the selection tool to first make a selection and then fill it. You can also use the pen tool to create a path, then convert it into a selection and then fill it. It's up to you how you want to paint it. Sometimes when the subject is wearing a dress and light is passing through a little bit, you might have to create several layers of shadows to make it look more natural. After you create the shadows, set the color and the blend mode properly and try to match that with the existing shadows in the image. Use that as a reference. Do not forget the contact point shadow. For example, my hand is touching the table. There's a shadow on the table, but just where my hand is touching the surface of the table, there would be a very dark area. In some cases, absolute darkness. So you might have to create another layer and just, just where the subject is just touching the ground, add a little more darkness right over there. After you have done all that, this might not be enough. Where the shadow is, a little bit of the darkness would also get onto the subject. So just above the subject, create a new layer and just paint around it. Change the blend mode to multiply, limit that just to the subject, add a little darkness around the shadow on the subject. Okay. After that, it's simple. You can match the ambient lighting by just applying a blurred version of the new background on top of that and change the blend mode to color and then use curves to match the lighting, the shadows and the color. And at the end, don't forget to apply an overall color grading or an overall filter, something overall. You can call this a global effect, which brings everything together. In this example, we just slapped in a lot crisp warm. 
that's it. I hope this video helped you in some way or the other. I hope you learned and picked up some techniques. And if it did help you, make sure to give us a like. And also don't forget to subscribe and not just subscribe. Ring the bell so that you don't miss any other future tips, tricks or tutorials. I would like to take this moment to thank all these nice and amazing people for supporting this channel on Patreon and helping keep Pixim Perfect free for everybody forever. Please do consider supporting Pixim Perfect on Patreon. It really helps me do all of these research, create all of these lessons and package that into a tutorial for you and just bring it out for you for free. There are some perks of becoming a member which you can check out in patreon.com slash piximperfect as well. And if you don't wish to support at the moment and just want to enjoy the video, I'm already grateful to you for giving me your time. I truly appreciate that. Thank you so much again for watching this video. I'll see you in my next one. Till then, stay tuned and make sure that you keep creating.